You know, I remember years ago, I talked to a man who was new to the church in general, not just our church. And he said, I like coming here, but I could do without all the song time. <laughs> and he really didn't have a concept for what worship is. And perhaps that's you. God's people, from the New Testament to the time the church began to today, have been singing the songs of praise to God for a particular reason, not for song time. Because when we join our voices, we join with the chorus of followers of Jesus throughout history and around the world, and we declare with our voices together who he is. And as we do that, the psalmist tells us that we, God inhabits our praise. He speaks to our hearts. He reminds us of what's true in our worship, and we need that. So it's good to come together and declare forever we will praise. We will sing to the Lord our God. Let's pray and ask him to speak to us through his word. God, we live in a culture full of uh, lots of opinions being fired out over social media and on the airwaves every day. And sometimes it's confusing and disorienting to know where to turn and where to look. And right now, in this moment, we turn to you, to your word. Sometimes we forget, even doubt. But in this moment, we are reminded by your spirit that you told us your word is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. It's able to pierce down to our very soul. We don't always like that, but we need it. So, Lord, speak to us through your word. We pray in your name. Amen. Recently, I had a conversation with somebody who uh, was changing churches. Now, if you're sort of a nominal church attender, changing churches can be like changing your favorite restaurant or the, or the gym. Uh, people do that all the time in our culture. I'm not sure that's good, but it happens. But if you're committed, if you're connected, if it feels like your spiritual family, changing churches can be a hard thing. And I asked, well, what brought you here? And he said, well, frankly, I'm, my old church was just getting too political. Interesting. We had a very fascinating conversation about what that meant and what they were looking for and, and uh, what they meant by political. Let me ask a question. This will be fun. I thought, today, I'm going to make everybody feel uncomfortable. <laughs> Is Jesus political? What do you think? <laughs> You're not going to answer out loud? I figured you'd be quiet, right? <laughs> Is Jesus political? It depends what we mean by that, right? The word political, polis, Greek word of the city, of the people, if political means does Jesus care about issues that affect people, yes, absolutely, Jesus and the gospel are political. But what most of us mean in our culture by political is not political, but partisan. Is Jesus connected to a party? Is Jesus hitched his wagon, or have we, for followers of Jesus, to a particular party or a point of view in our culture? The answer to that is a definitive no. And if you're squirming already, that, take that as the Holy Spirit working on you. So the gospel of Jesus Christ may at times be political, but it's never partisan, and we must not be either. Gallup poll in 2002 said 14% of Americans, by the way, 20 years ago, 2002, Gallup poll said 14% of Americans thought the other political party was not just wrong, but evil. Can you guess what that percent is today, 20 years later? I'll give you a hint, it's not 14%, 56%. That's shocking. Not wrong, it's okay to think people are wrong, but evil. America is more divided politically along partisan lines than at any time since the Civil War in our history. That's not news to you. If you believe what you're fed, by the way, there's a reason they call it a social media feed. You're being fed something. If you believe what you're fed on social media, you are tempted to assume that the entire country is in one extreme or the other. I don't think that's true. I think many are in the weary middle, confused, frustrated. As followers of Jesus in our series called Following the King, what do we do? How do we handle this? It might surprise you to know that Jesus has something to say about this. Maybe it doesn't. It might surprise you what he has to say about this. More than you might think he has to say, actually. In a few brief verses in Mark chapter 12. Now, last week we were in Mark chapter 10. We looked at the story of blind Bartimaeus, where Jesus reveals that actually Bartimaeus could see things that those with physical eyes could not. Jesus' identity and his own need. Chapter 11, which we're going to move past today, we'll come back to that in the triumphal entry when we get to Palm Sunday, is Jesus coming into the holy city. In chapter 12, he has this fascinating encounter where the religious and political authorities conspire to trap him. Let's read the story, Mark chapter 12, verses 13 through 17. 
And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. This is a fairly well-known passage out of the story of Jesus in the Gospels. It's one we've preached on before, but I thought it important for us to revisit as we're looking at following the king because it's so relevant for us. How do we follow Jesus, follow the king, in a politically divided culture in which we live? What does it mean for us? It's amazing that they, they conspire to trap him in his talk. People are still trying to prove that Jesus is on their side, one side or the other. There's no shortage of those who claim that, that God is on their side of whatever the issue is. First thing that's evident here is a revealing question. A revealing question. Now, it's revealing in lots of ways. We need to do a little bit of historical background and context work to understand what's really going on here. You might know the story in terms of like the, the cliff notes or the outline of it, but there's something that's happening here that might be lost to us in the 21st century that's happening in the first century. So two groups approach Jesus to trap him. These groups are the Pharisees and the Herodians. The Pharisees, so if you don't, we've talked about them before. They had strict adherence, adherence to the Old Testament Mosaic law. They were serious about being morally pure by keeping the law of God. And they deeply dis resented and hated Roman occupation or interference. So their answer to the question that's being posed is, you should not pay the tax because we're, we're against Roman involvement. In all things of, of Jewish affairs, religious and political, there was no difference to them. They were one thing. The Herodians are lesser known to us. You might remember Herod the Great, who was the puppet king under Roman rule when Jesus was born. By this time, there's Herod Philip and Herod Antipas, his sons. The Herodian dynasty were puppet kings that were propped up by the Roman occupation. So the Herodians were in league with the Herodian dynasty, and they were sympathizers with Rome. Their answer would have been, yes, pay the tax. So... But the point is, these two groups did not agree on anything, religiously or politically. But they agreed on one thing. We don't like this Jesus guy. The one thing they agreed on is, how do we get rid of him? He's a problem. Isn't that fascinating? They would not align on anything in the culture except, let's get rid of Jesus. Even the way they approach Jesus with all their in, insincere compliments. We know that you're a teacher of the truth. We know that you only speak what's true. You don't care about appearances. You're not swayed by opinions. They don't mean any of that. They really don't even care about his answer, if you think about it. They're not interested in whether or not, the, the question, should you pay taxes, they don't really care about his answer because they don't agree. They just figure, no matter what he says, we got him. Declare. Pick a side, Jesus, and we've got you. That's the point. They're trying to reveal Jesus as a fraud, to trap him. They're not just asking about, asking about paying taxes to Caesar. They're talking about something called the imperial head tax in Rome. Now, the, it's an annual tax for every individual for the right of being uh, under Caesar's rule, whether you want it to be or not. You paid a tax to be ruled by Caesar. It wasn't actually that much. There were lots of different taxes. It wasn't the amount. It was what it symbolized. Historical background here. The, the head tax was paid to be paid with a specific coin called a, a denarius, and it had Caesar's face on it. It was actually his, minted out of his wealth. So you were paying back to him what was already his, supposedly. Uh, every person per year was instituted. It was one denarius per year. It was instituted in 6 A.D., and when it was instituted, a man named Judas the Galilean, not Judas Iscariot, a different guy. This is before Jesus, 25 years before Jesus. Judas the Galilean 
uh, leads a revolt over this tax. In fact, he cleanses the temple. Sound familiar? Goes into the temple, kicks out all the Romans and the Gentiles, and, uh, and, and f- makes a proclamation that no Jew should pay the tax. Said that God is king, not Caesar. Eventually he's pursued with all of his rebel followers and he's uh, executed for it. So all this took place about 25 years before this story in Mark 12. So you see what's going on? These two opposing political parties get together and say, let's get Jesus to declare, are you, are you, a, are you a troublemaker, revolutionary or not? What do you think about this issue? It's a relevant, hot political issue of the day. Pick one today. Declare your side and we've got you. Keep in mind, Jesus has been coming, talking about the kingdom. He's been proclaiming the message of the kingdom of God. He declares himself to be king, and there's a kingdom, which is a threat to Rome. And he's already cast out the money changers of the temple. So you see what's going on here. This kind of political game playing still goes on today, doesn't it? People trying to get somebody, trap somebody, got your questions. So if Jesus says, no, don't pay the tax, they, they phrase it twice. Should we pay it or not? Is it right or is it wrong to pay taxes? Pick a side, Jesus. If he says, no, don't pay the tax, he is like Judas the Galilean, a troublemaker, a revolutionary, an insurrectionist, and, the, and Rome will crush him. If he says, yes, he's just another one of the people in league with Rome, like the Herodians, and the, and the people won't listen to him. He loses all credibility. Now, what happens in our culture when politicians are asked tough questions? My experience is they get really honest, introspective, thoughtful, uh, and they, they pause, and they, well, you know, this is gonna be hard for you to hear, but let me tell you honestly what I think. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be refreshing? But nobody, nobody could get elected if you say what's actually on your mind and heart. So they, they, what do they do? They don't answer. They dodge it, they change the subject, they avoid it. They, and this is not unique to either side of the political aisle. They all do this, right? There must be some school they go to, they're trained in it. And then you watch the debate or the, or the interview and we walk away going, what? Frustrated. Nobody answers. Well, when they walk away from Jesus, they marvel at him. He doesn't dodge it. He doesn't change the subject. He answers in a way that nobody expects and blows their minds if we understand it. This is a remarkable answer. He doesn't dodge the question or avoid the issue at all, but his answer is not what they expected. Let's look at verses 15 and 16. But knowing their hypocrisy, that's interesting, isn't it? How did he know? Well, it probably didn't take the omniscience of God, which he had as God. I mean, I think he knew what's in men's hearts. He said to them, Why put me to the test? We're told not to put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus says this when he's tempted in the wilderness. We read about this in Deuteronomy. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought one. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. We'll stop there. There's so much going on here. They're trying to get Jesus to declare a side. Whose side are you on, Jesus? Tell us. But Jesus refuses to be pigeonholed. I want you to pause for a minute. The one we say we're trying to follow refuses to be categorized on their terms. Refuses to be pigeonholed in the political ideology and camps of the day. He refuses to let their their understanding of an issue place him on their scale. Do we? I think as followers of Jesus, we can take, we need to follow him in this way. Doesn't mean we don't have opinions about issues that matter to God, about social issues, issues of life, and issues of justice. We should care about issues. But it means is I follow Jesus. I will not be categorized by your categories. I will not be into, lumped into your red and blue categories. I have a higher authority. Now I know some of you right now are going, yes, and some of you are going, wait a minute. I'm gonna let God speak to you about that while we move on. Jesus wouldn't do it. 
There is no such thing as the perfect party of Jesus. There never has been and there will not be on human terms. That doesn't mean that when you come to certain issues that one particular view may be more aligned with the gospel than others. Of course that's true. But that's not the same thing as saying this is his party. You think God's up in heaven going, let's see if they get on my, on my side of the political aisle. He's going, stop giving your soul to these things. Now, in our culture today, we want to separate the inner spiritual life from the public life. Right? You've heard this sort of thing, right? You have your own, inner, you have your own religion. You have your own spiritual views. That's fine for you. It's your truth. But keep that to yourself. But that shouldn't make its way into the public sphere or the way you interact. This is a relatively, this is a common, this is a modern misconception. It was not in the worldview of the ancients. To them, your faith, your religion had everything to do with how you interacted with the world. So if Jesus had come and said, you know, pay your taxes, be a good citizen, and just get inner spiritual peace of the king, nobody would have, he would have had no influence. What good is that? What difference does that make? But we, we must not just spiritualize the kingdom of God to the point that it has no impact in how we interact in the world. On the other hand, we must not politicize the kingdom of God. Do you understand the difference? Don't spiritualize it where it doesn't really matter. Don't politicize it where you're confusing it with the kingdom of this world. Jesus asked them to bring him a denarius, a specific coin minted for this tax. You'll see an image of the denarius here. This is actually the denarius of Tiberius Caesar. This is Caesar when Jesus said this. This is, this is a replica of that exact coin, by the way. I've got a silver dollar my grandfather gave me. Very different, right? Bring me one. Let me look at it. Isn't it ironic that Jesus doesn't have one, but they do? <laughs> Bring me one. Oh, uh, okay. You know, they've got the text they're asking about. Whose, whose image, whose inscription is on this? By the way, the inscription on the, the Tiberius uh, Denarius said... Uh, you, in Latin, or in Greek, excuse me, the time, written in Latin and then translated to Greek, Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus, Pontificus Maximus. In English, Caesar, son of God, and high priest. No wonder the Jews hated the tax. Jesus asked them for a coin. They bring it to him. And in his answer, we see how he refuses to do three things, which I think are instructive for us. Number one, he does not give in to political simplicity. What I mean by that is the issues are not as simple as we make them out to be. They're complex because people are complex. It's a yes or no question, Jesus. Actually, it's not. And very often that's the truth. Two, political complacency. Well, can't make any difference anyway. And three, political primacy. Simplicity, complacency, and primacy are three errors we must avoid when it comes to the political world. Let's look at verse 17. Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. In this simple statement, Jesus shatters their categories. They don't go away, go away frustrated because he won't answer the question. They marvel at him. They're astounded. Only those things which bear Caesar's image belong to Caesar. Whose image? Okay, it's his money, give it to him. He wants his money? Fine, give him his money. What's the implied question he doesn't ask? You're asking about this, which has Caesar's face on it. I'm talking about you. Whose image and whose inscription is on you? Give to Caesar what is Caesar. Give to God what is God's. Now, it's fascinating, in his answer, he changes the verb in Greek. They ask the Greek word dunai, which means uh, to present tribute. This is the tribute tax, the head tax, the tribute to Caesar for being, being one of his citizens. 
Jesus changes the Greek verb when he answers with the word render. He doesn't use dunai. He uses a different Greek word. He uses the word apodidomai, which means to pay back. This is fascinating. I've never seen this really before, studying this for a couple, a couple of years ago. They say, should we give tribute to Caesar? He says, pay back what you owe him and pay back what you owe God. What do you owe God? What do you owe him? What's his? It's a question worth pondering. Pay what you owe to Caesar and pay what you owe to God. Now, by the way, this is the first theory of limited government in human history. Think about it. Prior to this, every ruler, every leader, every king claimed divine right and absolute allegiance. They still did after Jesus, right? But they said, I, I, I'm, I rule by divine authority and you must give me absolute allegiance. Caesar did. The Persian kings did. The Babylonian kings did. The, the Macedonian kings did. Rulers still do it. We're a little more savvy in our culture about how we say it. God's chosen candidate. We use these kinds of phrases. Jesus says, you may give back to Caesar his money, but you must not ever give to Caesar what belongs to God. What belongs to God? You, your heart, your allegiance, your worship, your life. That is not Caesar's. It does not belong to him. It belongs to your God. This is a revolutionary response. They're asking Jesus, are you a revolutionary? Like, like Judas the Galilean? This is Jesus the Galilean. He's a different kind of revolutionary, but he is revolutionary. His response is brilliant, and it is truly a revolutionary call to you and to me, to his followers, then and now. But not the kind of revolution anybody ever thought. The kingdom will come, he's saying. The king will reign, but it's not going to be by elections or military overthrow or revolt. By resistance or political acquiescence, neither will get it done. The key in the question is the question Jesus asked about, again about the coin. Whose likeness and whose image? The Bible makes this clear from start to finish. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 27. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Imago Dei, image bearers. You walk into a temple, pagan temple, any kind of temple, and there are statues, images, right? Right? Gods fill their temples with their images. Well, the one God, the true God, the God of the universe, has filled his temple, which is the whole earth, with bearers of his image. People. Us. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, and Colossians 3, 10, the Apostle Paul in different ways says the same thing. Those of us who belong to Jesus now, we're all made in God's image, but sin has tarnished that image and we have not been able to find our way back to him. So he comes to pursue us in Christ, to ransom us through his death and resurrection, to redeem us and buy us back. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, you are not your own, you're bought with a price, therefore honor God with your body. And here he says, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God. There's the same question Jesus asked, whose likeness? In true righteousness and holiness. And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. So not only are you made in his image, but even though you've messed that up, you've tarnished the image by sin, he has come to redeem you and buy you back and claim you as his own daughter and son and renew you in the image of his son. Don't you ever give yourself to anyone but him. Doesn't belong there. Caesar wants his head tax. Fine. That's good and right. But God wants your worship and your allegiance and your heart. Don't confuse the two. So neither acceptance of the system nor straightforward political revolt are going to get done what God wants to get done. 
Let's wrap this up by saying, give to Caesar. Jesus says, give to Caesar. What is Caesar? Okay, well, we don't have a Caesar, but we have political authorities and rulers over us as citizens of this nation. If you're a citizen of other nations, if you're not an American citizen, welcome. We're all citizens of his kingdom. But we live in worlds and civilizations and cultures and nations governed by rulers. What do we owe them? Give to Caesar. What? Give to Caesar your obedience and your prayerful participation. Go and read Romans chapter 13, uh, 1 through 10, the classic text on this, right? But even in there, we see that human authorities and leaders are derivative authorities. They're, they're established by God, even the ones that we don't like. Do you think Tiberius? People are looking, well, he's a godly man. No, that's not the point. The point is all human authority, even broken sinful authority, is derivative authority by the ultimate authority which belongs to God. So give to Caesar, or in our culture, our allegiance to our nation's leaders, our obedience to the laws, and our prayerful participation. So pray, pray. I was with a group of pastors just this past week. We meet every month at pastors in the, in the, in the Tri-Cities area to get together to pray and to have lunch together. And we're praying, and one of the pastors said, you know, it's a mistake for us every time we gather if we don't pray for our nation's leaders. We should be on our knees for our leaders. And that they're exactly right. You should too. And I don't just mean, Lord, smite them, because I don't agree with them, right? I mean, pray for wisdom, for humility, for grace, for perseverance and pressure that we can't even imagine. Pray for them to repent and be humbled on their knees and receive the grace that God wants to give them. Pray for wise counselors around them. Pray for our nation's leaders. And participate. Vote. Care about uh, issues that matter to you and matter to God. Run for office even if God leads you to that. Absolutely. We're not to withdraw and hide away and pretend like this that doesn't exist as followers of Jesus. But give to God. Give to God what? Your worship and your whole life. I look out at what's happening in, in so many of us and in the world today is people are getting this flipped around. They're given to God a little prayer, prayer participation once a week, but they're given their soul to a political party. It's exactly the opposite of what Jesus says. We mentioned Romans 13. Go one chapter earlier, earlier, Romans 12, verse 1. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices to God. This is pleasing to him, and it's your spiritual act of worship. Offer yourselves to him. Friends, let's not confuse God and Caesar. So many are doing that. I'm honestly not sure. I'm not qualified to make any statements about this, but I'm not sure how to bring our country together politically. But I know what will bring us together as followers of Jesus. If we will stop giving to Caesar what belongs to God. Our hope is not in the White House or the or school board or what elections or midterm elections. That is not our hope. We care about those things, but that is not our hope. We have only one hope. We only have one hope. Do I have to tell you what it is? Can you shout it out? We only have one hope. It is our king. It is Jesus. The whole series is following him. He's it. And he, the Rome, Rome dominated the world. There was no concept of the world outside of Rome. Rome ruled, and then Rome's gone. And you know what? United States of America, well, I love being an American. I'm grateful that I'm an American. I'm not confused about who's king. I'm not confused about whose kingdom I, I have allegiance to. America will come and go, but the kingdom of God stands forever. All the world's kingdoms, governments, power structures operate on the basic principle of wealth and power, right? Jesus was the king without a coin. Didn't have one. Caesar's the king with all the coins. One's gone and one's still reigning. Don't get it confused. I, I, we desperately need to get this right. Many, many people who claim to follow Jesus are getting it wrong. Sometimes some of us are getting it wrong. 
2,000 years ago, they came to trap Jesus, and he gave us this beautiful vision and answer that still rings in our hearts today. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. We do owe allegiance and prayer and participation and faithful citizenship to the rulers of, of our nation and of our world. But we owe to God everything. Let's pray. King Jesus, we humbly come before you acknowledging that we get this wrong in our hearts. We get twisted up. We get angry. We get fearful. We get distracted. Thank you that your word cuts down through the centuries and through all the layers of confusion in our own minds and hearts and our culture, right to our own hearts where we need it most. Thank you that you are king and there is no other. Forgive us when we give to you a little tribute and we give to our, our political parties and our nation's rulers our hearts and souls. Teach us by your spirit to turn that around, to offer to you our whole selves, and out of that love and grace to be good citizens of the world in which we live. We pray this in your name and for your sake, King Jesus. Amen.